I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So let's build on that meditation. And um, I'm still zapped by it. I don't know about you. So. <laughs> So let me see if I can try to explain what I mean. Um, there's no escape from, de from desire. Every living thing has desire in the sense of goal-directed activity. A plant desire in some sense, desiring the light, right? Uh, the fish in the pond in my backyard, uh, does, you know, seeking the food that I, you know, give them at sunset. Uh, it's it's inherent, you know, deep in the cellular structure of individual cells. There are goal-directed activities and regulators of goal-directed activities. There's just no escape from it. So how do we be about it? It's kind of the, really the question. And the Buddha's breakthrough in the context of the ascetic Jain, quote unquote, practice of his time 2,500 years ago that was essentially escapist. It was essentially starve yourself so much that you die. And, you know, that's how to deal with life. Wow, <laughs> really? That's, the, that's all you got? <laughs> starve yourself and die? Wow. So the Buddha basically said, no, we can be in life we can satisfy the ordinary desires of the body for food, you know, and as he recovered from his, ascetic, his asceticisms and helped his body have enough energy to go through a profound awakening. Also, he recognized that there were certain experiences, uh, like these blissful experiences uh, when he was young, that were perfectly fine. Uh, there is a great deal of teaching in early Buddhism that is about wholesome desire, uh, which is distinct from the craving in the second noble truth that creates suffering. This is a really important point. Wholesome desire that others not suffer. The wholesome desire for his phrase, that happiness which is visible in this present life. The mudita, the desire for the happiness of others. Compassion the desire that they not suffer, kindness, metta, loving kindness, the desire that they be happy, right? Wise intentions, the desire to not be controlled by um, wanting pleasure, uh, the desire to release ill will toward others. It's the second aspect of wise intention, the desire to um, not harm others or oneself, right? The desire to take the next breath. So his profound exploration was how do we be in the world, including as householders, who in his teaching are as capable of full awakening as a monastic. There are things about being a monastic in which one entirely focuses on processes of awakening that can be really helpful. And there are other important functions carried by the monastics uh, that have been a great blessing for us and for the world in general over the last 2,500 years, with some mistakes, notably around patriarchy and the uh, suppression and disrespect of uh, women. That said, uh, you and I, as householders, we have full access to the whole path. So the Buddha was basically asking, okay, how do we be in the world? How do we, how do we include the needs of the body? How do we um, live with each other? How do we honor wholesome desire without being caught by it? 
without contracting and stressing and creating suffering and harm for others, right? Contentment. One of the main pathways in Buddhism for this kind of freedom and uh, ease in relationship to the, the underlying biological machinery of grasping that wants pleasure and wants to avoid pain. One half of the Buddha's approach is through insight into the nature of all experiences as dukkha, that's the first noble truth, as um, all experiences uh, sometimes include unpleasant ones. All experiences include the fact that every experience is impermanent, including pleasant experiences. And uh, all experiences are made of parts that are connected and changing and occur dependently, part of a larger relational whole, so they are inherently incapable of being possessed and um, identified with as oneself, because they're constantly changing, right? These are the three attributes of dukkha, the first noble truth. There's no escape from dukkha. And the one half, in a sense, of the Buddhist teaching is to really recognize these facts through vipassana, insight, which might start conceptually, becomes more and more uh, in the meat <laughs> of your body. Your body more and more knows impermanence. It just, it's, it has banged against impermanence often enough that it finally gives up in a, almost an underlying kind of way. And you develop a kind of disenchantment uh, in Pali, the word nibbida, not disgust, as it's sometimes been translated as, not disgust with reality, but disenchantment. You realize, eh, this feels great, it's going to end. <laughs> you know, this feels horrible, it's going to keep changing. It may keep feeling horrible, but it will be a different kind of horrible. Right? Okay, and there's a lot of emphasis in the Buddha Dharma that has come down to us in early, from early Buddhism about insight into the impermanent, selfless, uh, relational nature of all experiences and pretty much just about everything in physical reality. Okay, there's that part. But then there's this other part <laughs> that is sort of latent in early Buddhism. And uh, I want to foreground it more with you. Not because I think the Buddha was wrong about anything or something is left out. It's more like, let's see what value might be had by foregrounding the sense of contentment already. See what I mean? Insight realizes the kind of meh, in experiences which undermines chasing after them with craving. But another way to undermine craving is by feeling already content. Already content, which is a much more embodied, inside out and bottom up, an honoring of the sweet animal of the body than the more insight-oriented, intellectual, heady focus of vipassana and um, disenchantment and renunciation. I'm not a, you said I'm saying I'm not against insight. I'm an insightful guy, you know, <laughs> to a fault, right? I'm not against disenchantment or um, renunciation. Uh, I'm saying, and also, what about another ally in holding life lightly and enjoying it as it moves through our fingers 
without trying to grab the rope of life and creating friction in the process. Contempt. Let's, let's consider many, many examples uh, from our uh, non-human animal cousins of contentment. And um, I invite you, if you like, to put into the chat examples of non-human animals feeling content. Like, I grew up in Los Angeles, kind of on the edge of the hills there, and um, these blue-bellied lizards were very common. And I just still remember how they would move into the sun, like on a warm rock, and start doing lizard push-ups. <laughs> I don't know, but they sure look pretty content. Uh, you know, someone put in cats purring, cats, 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 yep. A deep dog sigh, yep. Turtles on a log in the sun, yes, exactly. And it's kind of easy to see contentment maybe in our you know, non-human animal cousins. Um, I can think of horses coming home. You know, my father grew up on a ranch in North Dakota, and horses, some background there. You know, they come home from a day of work or a long ride, and you know, they make it to the barn. <laughs> The saddle gets pulled off and they roll around a little maybe and then they rub up against each other and get something to eat and drink. They sure look pretty content. And the biological basis for their contentment is present in us as well. I uh, had a really profound spiritual teacher uh, in, my, in the 1980s, in my late 20s and early 30s, um, Adi Da. Lavananda, um, some controversy around him, and and also his teachings just had a, there was a lot about them that was pretty amazing. One of his books was titled "The Eating Gorilla Comes in Peace." It was about diet and spiritual practice, and you know when we're already full, we are content, right? Already full. And you might also, if you like in the chat too, begin reflecting on times when you feel like, ha, ah, already full. Maybe you've just had a satisfying meal and maybe it's just for a few seconds before the machinery of craving starts going again, looking for something new to want. When we are content, Christina Feldman defined contentment for me as um, a sense of well-being with no wish for anything more in the present. Contentment is um, affectively positive. It's emotionally positive. There's a sense of satisfaction or fulfillment. It's positive. It's not just blank, right? I'm, I, I am marking contentment as distinct from equanimity. Now, contentment can support equanimity. Ultimately, though, it's important to establish an equanimity that can include discontent. Equanimity is the ultimate non-reactivity to whatever is in the mind. That said, there is a place for other things to be in the mind, such as tranquility or bliss. Also, uh, with equanimity among the seven factors of awakening. I noticed that Carla put in uh, contentment often shows up as gratitude for me. That's really interesting. Uh, I named, I called out um, thankfulness and gratitude and you know, gladness as friends of contentment. Yeah. And it's interesting that Carla put in gratitude for oneself. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. And I know Carla means it in, in a really deep way because I know Carla a little and at least, and you know, uh, it's not gratitude for some presumed entity inside. It's more like gratitude for the whole Carla process. 
the body-mind process that has a certain coherence over time with the Carla name tag on it. Well, I'm going to be reflecting on this one. Gratitude for the person, one's own person process. All right. All right. So <clears throat> now we can experience a transient sense of contentment that's contingent on recent events. All right. You know, dare I say it, post-coital contentment, maybe. Um, maybe there's a sense of, um, you know, the kids are in bed, your partner's not talking to you anymore, it doesn't need anything. You're just like, it was a good day of effort, you got your job done, good enough. <laughs> and there you are with your book at the end of a day, speaking of myself. Uh, yeah, that's that's okay. That's contingent. But what I'd like to explore more and more with you is unconditional contentment. Whoa. How do we how do we find that? Okay. So I want to name or nominate for your consideration several ways in to establishing unconditional contentment. Before I do that, though, I want to name or identify a couple of, or, or anticipate some yes buts. Here we go. I want to anticipate a few uh, yes buts. Um, so, Sometimes when we are just awash in contentment, like, I don't know about you, <laughs> I, was, I was getting sucked in there to the deep end of the pool toward the end of that meditation uh, as a concentration practice, as an absorption practice. In other words, taking contentment as an object of meditation and becoming increasingly absorbed in it as you absorb it into yourself. Uh, there are times when it's so luscious and dense and uh, almost syrupy that the idea of getting up and pursuing some wholesome good goal. It's like, uh, nah, I'm just, I'm like the lizard in the sun. Do, 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 do. <laughs> That's it, right? Uh, <laughs> um, that's true. But very often, it's very possible to have, you know, kind of a high level of, um, to feel a certain contentment in the core while pursuing goals. And it's possible to have a sense of feeling content about certain aspects of one's life while being discontent or frustrated about others. It may be that you feel a basic sense of enoughness in your access to food, which is for our non-human cousins, uh, a great source of discontent when they're hungry and foraging or hunting. Right. Um, it's quite something to have food security. And let's keep in mind, of course, the billion or so people in the, in the world right now, including people in America, who don't have that. Children who go to bed hungry or die through starvation, through hunger. That said, I suspect that those present here have the opportunity of feeling content about your access to food. There's enough food. You can afford to feel content about that. There may be issues around eating, and that's distinct from the point I'm making, sense of content about food. While over here, you might just, honestly, you just can't locate a sense of feeling content uh, related to someone you're really worried about or something in your career. But at least over here, you can feel content about this part. Recognizing that is really useful. And over time, you can kind of build out from places where you are content. Okay. Uh, you, a person can feel really quite satisfied and fulfilled in a certain area of their life while still eager to do more. Wanting to actualize, keep actualizing their capabilities in Maslow's terms of self-actualization. You have abilities. You're a horse. You're a thoroughbred. You've won some races. You're glad. 
you won some races and you still, you know, you want to keep running because that's your nature. Okay. And what's interesting also anticipating another yes, but, and then I'll move into how to be content unconditionally, which has honestly for me been one of the more useful aspects of practice for myself over the last five years or so, because I tend to be quite driven uh, with an underlying sense of discontent, needing more, you know, in terms of accomplishing things. So it's been good practice, really quite profound. So the, the other yes, but I want to anticipate is we can feel understandably furious, a word I don't use lightly, morally furious at certain things in the world, outraged, you know, not hateful, hopefully, but furious about injustice, mistreatment, lies, commitment to lying. Huh. You know, <laughs> that can really be there and maybe it ought to be there, right? In given certain con things in the world, uh, past and very present, uh, while at some level inside, there's just this unshakable deep contentment that is not at odds with that moral outrage and pursuit of justice, pursuit of the common good, not just the good of the few by disadvantaging the many in structural ways, right? So it's possible to be content while also doing the best you can to help the world be better. And I acknowledge what Melinda put in, and I appreciate you saying it. I'm I'm not presuming that you, everyone here is food secure, so I, I appreciate the correction. If you are, that's just an example that's fairly primal of an opportunity to feel content in a particular area. And there might be other areas for you as well where you can authentically really feel content. And right on, Melinda. And by the way, I, I always appreciate real-time correction, <laughs> period. <laughs> and especially anything that in which, because of my privilege and perspectives, I leave something out. Very important. I always really appreciate calling that out. Okay. So how about uh, ways you can, um, you know, be, uh, build up more sense of contentment in the present? And I also acknowledge Madison's distinction. And I think, you know, is it nitpicking or not? No, for me, it's not in my value stack. I really do want to know if I'm leaving something out or a person out. Uh, so I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, and because I reserved for myself the right to decide whether something's nitpicking, I therefore can be particularly receptive to everything else. Right? I don't say that to flatter myself. I'm saying that to make a point that by being strong in your own autonomy about you deciding how you're going to regard input, you know, um, that enables you to be really much more open. Okay, so onward. Let's focus on contentment now. Contentment, focusing on contentment. Um, you know, so let's keep going. Contentment, contentment, people. Uh, so, one way is to repeatedly internalize the sense of enoughness, especially in primal ways, like around breathing. All right? Okay? So right now, can you do it with me? Now, this may not be real for you. If you have a history, perhaps speaking of inclusiveness, if you have a history of asthma or have trauma related to breath, you know, this may not fit for you. I'm not saying it's universal, but perhaps there could be a sense of really attending to the enoughness of air as you inhale now. Enoughness. You know, our culture tends to keep us thirsty, hungry, desirous, um, on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Our 
culture tends to do that, right? Um, also, there is something in the brain that I've come to really appreciate. I think of it as delusional wanting. You already have plenty, but yet the brain keeps looking for more because that's a way to motivate, you know, creatures with a nervous system to keep on foraging, keep on hunting, keep on looking, right? So you have to push through that delusion to recognize, oh, as I inhale, there's enough, if there is for you, right? I'm appreciating, Margaret, what you're saying. People with long COVID, this may not be an appropriate practice. I'm just saying it's skillful to look for opportunities that are authentic, that are authentic for you to experience enoughness in the present repeatedly, especially if you have a history of being shorted or mistreated and not having had enough. It's really important to soothe and support and strengthen your body mind by looking for where there is enough, not to deny what was taken from you or how you were shorted or disadvantaged. No. To strengthen yourself and also to find the peace and contentment and fulfillment that is available to you and is under your control. Right? It could be around eating where you deliberately eat a little more slowly and you pay attention to the sense of enough. I believe I read there was a one time there's a Sufi saying that at the end of a meal, our bellies should be about one third food, one third water and one third air. <laughs> there's a Taoist teaching uh, that one who knows when enough is enough can always have enough. Knowing when enough is enough. Okay, so is there enough? Is there enough? Um, that's a really, really, really useful experience, repeatedly. You could do it interpersonally, right? Uh, you know, that um, you can feel like your friend has given you enough attention, really enough, in the moment. Like you'll have a little interaction, there'll be a back and forth, and you'll just think to yourself, and you can do this practice. I'm recommending a practice. I'm telling you how to train your nervous system to feel, to have growing access to the emotional memories of contentment in the present, right? So how remarkable to be with a friend back and forth, right? Little, you bring something up and you feel there's enough here. You feel maybe when it, it's authentic, only then. But when it is authentic, take it in your friend has heard you, or we've completed this little back and forth about this little thing, whatever it was, at work or at home. It's complete, completion. When it is complete, can we feel content in the present with what is complete? Know what it feels like, and then take an extra beat, half a breath, a full breath, that glimmer, as Linda just put in, of Oh, enough. And what you'll, you'll observe if your brain is like mine, you know, a standard issue, uh, you will just watch again and again. Actually, you feel content. And then your brain er, starts looking for something new to want, something that's missing elsewhere. You know, it's like, and you have to keep bringing the attention back. This is a version, by the way, of the practice I've taught a lot of noticing you're all right right now in the present when you are, that you're basically all right right now. Um, that has to do, pardon me, with our need for safety. This topic tonight is much more about our need for contentment. Noticing that there's enough already in places where there is. And frankly, I notice that as people train in this way, I'm using the word train deliberately, it's a really sweet training, isn't it? Whoa, enough already. Five minutes a day, you know, 
three seconds here, 10 seconds there, adding up at most, right? When people do this, I can say it's certainly for myself, they really become more resilient and stronger. They're more able to handle deprivation and delayed gratification and, you know, putting up with difficulty and pain and um, staying strong in the pursuit of, of asserting themselves with other people. Because deep down inside, you know, they've built up a body memory with somatic markers with repetition again and again and again of like enough already, which gradually deconditions auto craving, automatically craving more, the habit of being not enough, have to keep going, have to stay hungry, you know, and all the rest of that. Okay. So that's a very, very big way to do it. I'll name two others and then I'll see what you make of all this. Okay. Second, there's a really interesting thing. Okay, let me invite you into doing it. Just take a few moments in the present of being aware of all that is appearing in awareness, like simultaneously. Over the, over the course of a second or quarter seconds, all that is occurring, all those sensations, pop, 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 pop. All those thoughts, pop, 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 sounds, shh, sights, whoosh, you know, memories, images, shh, shh, whoosh. you may have heard me liken um, awareness to the surface of a glass of soda water, really fizzy soda water. And if you look at the surface in slow motion, like imagine really, you know, slowing things down to the time scale of synapses that are firing five to 50 times a second. You know, we're talking fifths of a second, hundredths of a second, slow-mo, super slow-mo, the surface of, you know, that class of soda water, fizzy water. And you're watching all over the surface, these various bubbles appearing, coming surface, spreading, popping, ripples spreading, all that happening. Wow. Well, if you just kind of open to that, so much is arriving continual, continuously. It's, over, it's almost overwhelming. There's so much already, just to the sheer phenomenology of experiencing. <laughs> you know, open your, your mouth and awe, like, oh, wow, ah, you know, slow it down, except we can't slow it down. It just keeps coming. Wow, right there. There's so much already that recognition of all that arriving um, tends to undermine desire for more. Who could want anything more? It's like so much coming already. All right. And then the last thing I'll say is um, in a, in a, to find unconditional contentment. In addition to repeatedly internalizing experiences of contentment, and second, noticing that inherent in, in just experiencing consciousness is this like almost overwhelming arriving of everything. Third, it's really it's really um, possible to notice that there's this kind of quarter second or half second, almost like a buffer continuously in the stream of consciousness. If you get close to the front end or you're just kind of really in the present, or like I said, always just before desire is contentment. In other words, there's a base state of ongoing beingness. And in ongoing beingness is a sense of content, being content as being. Content as being always precedes becoming. So the more we can be in touch with ongoing being just prior to becoming. The Buddha really called this out, by the way, because he really called out uh, attachment to becoming as one of the major sources of craving and suffering and harm. So you rest in, you just become more mindful 
It's like becoming more aware of this little space that's ongoing, that's always just under or just prior to uh, desire. I don't know how else to say it than that. <laughs> Maybe you were able to experience it during the meditation because things got quiet enough to, to access it. But there is a place where like always just before, continuously just before desire is a place of peace. Okay, I'll leave that there. Um, yeah. And then I'll just say one last thing really quickly, which is to just ask ourselves, with regard to all kinds of situations, do I really need to be dissatisfied with this? And we often bump into situations with other people. You know, do I really need to be frustrated with this? Do I really need to be dissatisfied? Um, and if, you know, you think it's a really big deal and you do need to be dissatisfied, fine. And and if you're not, not able to nudge yourself with that inquiry, got it, no worries. Let's just keep, keep you know, uh, keep at it. But there's all kinds of situations where we, we walk into them with the habit of discontent, the habit of criticism, the habit of dissatisfaction, right? It's like we walk into the restaurant looking for what's wrong. We walk into the situation with another person uh, looking for why, uh, why to be disappointed, you know, looking for reasons to be disappointed, right? These are kind of habits. And I'm not talking about letting people push you around or giving up your rights. I'm just raising a question. And like for myself, um, with my wife, my long suffering wife, like sometimes I'll say something like about a situation with getting food for dinner, something really basic, fine. So I'll say something, and then she'll say something that is sort of divergent from what I said, right? And I'm suddenly trying to track, why are you saying those words? Or what, what does that have to do with what I said? Or did I misunderstand something? Or are you disagreeing with me? Or are you changing the subject? Or like, what, you know? Okay, now right there, Bingo, I have, I can see people smiling. They know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, could have, I could get into my habit of discontent because it's happened many times with her. Now I'm sure I do it too, right? So in any case, um, do I have to come into this being dissatisfied? And, um, you know, I, um, I would just want to raise a question, you know, do I need to be dissatisfied about that sort of thing? Do I need to be discontent? And that's a fair question to ask ourselves that addresses our tendency perhaps uh, toward habits of dissatisfaction and discontent. Okay, all right. So let's see here. I fear that my comment about, you know, finding contentment if you have enough food um, has a, opened up a can of worms. And I would just, uh, without getting into the detail of it, I think I wanna stay on the track of contentment as a topic. You know, I just wanna repeat the general guidelines, which may have been followed. I'm not trying to referee it here, but I'll just say general guidelines are to avoid, if you can, avoid, please, um, trying to you know persuade, educate, criticize, or school, other people and focus not on propositions um, about the world out there, but focus on your own practice in here. Okay, so uh, let's see, contentment. Very good. I am content with your responses <laughs> to my talk on contentment. It's really worth watching. I, I'll, you know, you may know my material about um, <clears throat> the three needs, safety, satisfaction, connection. 
loosely related to the three-stage evolution of the brain, brainstem, you know, reptilian brainstem, mammalian subcortex, primate human, neocortex. I'm massively simplifying a lot of details, but, you know, it's a kind of a useful, fuzzy structure. Uh, in that context, uh, if you think about uh, experiences of, you know, what does it feel like when you feel safe enough? We kind of become peaceful. If you feel satisfied enough, you become content. If you feel connected enough, you move into love. Okay, great. So you might ask yourself, where is your primary issue? You know, is it hard for you to feel at peace? Is it hard for you to feel content? Is it hard for you to feel love, rested in love, loved and loving? love flowing in and flowing out, right? To my great surprise, as someone who is temperamentally uh, uh, a little anxious, wow, contentment, that was hard. So you might explore this for yourself. You know, we live in a society in which we are trained from early age to be discontent, dissatisfied, always hungry. It's a great way to drive consumerist capitalism. Right? And to get workers who are always trying to outperform each other. Uh, competition. Uh, um, and really, you know, you might find that feeling content in the present is a good big practice for you. It's also true that when we feel content, someone brought this up earlier, it moves you into connection, you know. Um, I don't think feeling content necessarily moves you into a sense of safety, but there is something about when we feel content, we come in peace like the eating gorilla with others and we're more available, right? Um, we're more available for contact with others. And... Okay. Let's see if there's anything else to speak to in the remaining couple minutes. I see great questions. There's tremendous good content in the chats and everything. Um, Debbie asks, good question, Debbie. I'm not clear about the significance of knowing there is peace before desire. Um, I'm, in a way, I'm just pointing out that I think the sense of contentment always just before desire is authentically available. You have to see for yourself if it is. And if it is authentically available for you, resting attention increasingly in that contentment just before desire is a good way to build up the trait of contentment. It may probably be uh, a lot easier <laughs> to locate that sense repeatedly, that glimmer of that, oh, wow. I content before desire. It, it could be a lot easier to locate that while meditating or just, or when you're really content. Great. Um, you know, but over time, over time, you know, more and more, I'm, I'm really exploring how to, how to be lived by enthusiasm while feeling content already. Can you combine the sense of enthusiasm you know, for while feeling content, like, and start with like easy things, like making a nice, making a meal. Can you be enthusiastic about this new little sauce you're creating? Or I'm going to try curry powder in my scrambled eggs. I recommend it. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, while feeling content already, like in minglings, enthusiasm and contentment. That's interesting. Uh, okay. Well, I'm really glad I <laughs> took a crack at this topic. Um, great, I'm seeing con. Can I? By the way, there was a a person is trying to ask a question in the chat, but I don't. I haven't seen that question, so I'm just going to roll it over to next week. Okay. Uh, and you know who you are. I, I was. I asked you to put a question in the chat, and um, I haven't been able to find it. All right, great. Okay. And then, as we finish this week, I invite you to take contentment 
as an inquiry, not trying to fake it till you make it, but finding it where you authentically can. And, and then when you find it, uh, slowing down to rest in it so you get to know it better and it becomes more and more a part of you. And then related to that, um, it's really interesting to observe our interactions with others and the degrees to which we might be making them discontent. You know, like we're always a little dissatisfied or with them. Whoa. You know, we're always a little like, yes, good. And, and think about um, the opportunity to uh, communicate that you are content with another person. They're all, they've, they've made it with you. You know, they are all right as they are. You're content. What a beautiful gift. Think about how it feels to be with people uh, who let you know that they really appreciate you. They're content with who you are. You know? Inside of which, um, you know, they, there may be requests and, you know, ways we can dance even better with each other while being really fundamentally content with who the other person is. Okay. What a good service to the world, right? <laughs>